Good morning. This morning we're going to be reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. So 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we, who are alive, who are left, we will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Thanks, Eleanor. Before we uh, look at that passage together, let's pray. Lord God and Heavenly Father, as we open your word together now, we pray that you would be with us by your spirit to grant us understanding and encouragement and hope that comes from a deep faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, you might have heard the saying that nothing is certain in this life except for death and taxes. Uh, every year around June or July, we get a reminder about the certainty of taxes, don't we? We get our group certificate or our payment summary and we look at the tax withheld column and we go, I paid how much? And then it's a pain, you've got to dig out all your old receipts and find an accountant or do the dance of trying to do it yourself on MyGov. Every year, we get a reminder about the certainty of taxes. But the certainty of death is another story. We're pretty good at putting the idea of death out of our minds and living as if death doesn't exist. In the same way that some people try to dodge taxes, many of us are good at dodging the idea of death. But we can't dodge death indefinitely. Sooner or later, something comes along that gives us a reminder about the certainty of death. I don't know if you've had someone close to you pass away before, a grandparent or a parent or a friend or another loved one. There's something about someone you love dying that brings the reality and the certainty of death close to home. It can make you think about your own mortality. Well, the passage of the Bible that we've just read was written to people who were facing the reality of death. The Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote these words to the church in Thessalonica because he wanted to remind them of the great hope that we have in Jesus in life and even beyond death. And that's what we're going to look at today, that in Jesus we have a great hope in life and beyond death. We're going to see three things about that hope. Firstly, it's a, a unique hope. Secondly, it's a hope that looks backwards. And finally, it's a hope that looks forwards. So the first thing we see is that the hope that we have in Jesus is a unique hope. It's an exclusive hope. You might say that we have hope among the hopeless. Look at verse 13 of our chapter. Paul writes, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. In case you missed it, what the Bible is saying here is that the rest of mankind has no hope in death or otherwise. 
which is quite a shocking thing to say. I don't know if you ever look at the people around you, the people walking on the street or your colleagues at work, and think to yourself, these people have no hope. But that's the reality. It's a reality that ought to compel us to share the hope that we do have, to inform people about the hope that they can have in Jesus as well. You see, I want to show you there's a connection here between being uninformed on the one hand and grieving without hope on the other hand. Having the wrong information, putting your trust in the wrong things leads to hopelessness when it comes to death. And the people who this letter was addressed to, the church in Thessalonica, they were to some extent uninformed about death. It seems like what was going on is that they believed that Jesus was going to come back in their lifetime. That before they, any of them died, they would get to spend eternity with Jesus in paradise. But it seems like what happened is that one, maybe more of their church members had passed away and they were worried. They didn't know what was going to happen to these people who had passed away. Were they going to miss out on spending eternity with Jesus? The people left behind were, were grappling with these questions and it compounded their grief. But Paul says to them, brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be uninformed. We don't want you to grieve without hope. Yes, grieve. This passage isn't saying that grief is something that we ought to avoid. Death is still an enemy. It's ugly. It still hurts. The pain of loss is very real. And it's right to grieve. It's right to grieve. But we mustn't grieve without hope. Because it's a sad thing to see people who are grieving without hope. Before I started training for ministry, I was a social worker for about seven years. And one of the places I worked in was a little rural community, uh, about 50 k's out of Launceston. And one of the things I did, I was a community social worker, and one of the things I was involved in one year was facilitating and helping out with a grief and loss bereavement kind of group. And some of the stories there were just incredibly sad. There was one lady who was so distraught by the loss of her adult son that she basically couldn't function. Every single day she was just consumed by grief and angst. She had posted pictures of him on just about every wall in her house. She pretty much couldn't get on with daily life. She was an extreme example, perhaps, but there were others too. Others in that group who, you could tell, were just tremendously fearful of losing not only their loved one, but the memory of their loved one. Their loved one had passed away, and they were desperately clinging on to memories of their loved one in the hope that they wouldn't be forgotten. Others there thought that their loved ones were still with them in the presence of animals or plants even. And others just kind of held on to platitudes like, I know they're still with me, I can feel them with me. Now they might all be nice things, but the problem is they're not true. Those people's loved ones were gone. They weren't with them. They were gone. And it was quite tragic to walk alongside this group, support them, people who you might say were uninformed about death. And so they grieved without hope. I wonder, have you known anyone like that? People who have experienced deep grief or some other kind of pain with no hope. It's right for us, I think, to have a heart for those people, to feel something of their pain, to walk alongside them, 
be a friend and a companion, and always be ready to share the hope that we do have in Jesus. In the middle of a hopeless world, we have a very real and a very unique hope, and it's a hope that looks backwards. That's the second thing we see in our text. Our hope comes from looking back to the death and resurrection of Jesus. Verse 14 says, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Brothers and sisters, the the hope that we have is so much more than just empty platitudes. We base our hope on a person, the great person of history, his life and his death and his resurrection. The hope that we have is based on a person. It's based on real historical events. It's something that we can grab a hold of and and sink our teeth into. How do we do that? One of the ways we can do that is to, to really engage our minds and look into the evidence for Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection. When it comes to the resurrection, you've got an empty tomb that people at the time and historians since haven't really been able to explain how it was empty. You've got eyewitnesses. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that there's 500 eyewitnesses. But perhaps most compelling is the fact that Jesus' followers went from being kind of scared and scattered. It was over for them. It was done. Their master had died. It was all over. And they were hiding. And they went from that to then being bold and brazen and courageous proclaimers of the lordship and the resurrection of Jesus. How do you account for that? If you're a normal person, then you have seasons of doubt in your life. Is it all true? Is God really there? Is Jesus who he said he was? One day, my life is going to end. Your life is going to end. Can we really put our hope in the fact that God is going to be there on the other side. These sorts of questions can can shake us up and unsettle us. And something that can really help us, help us to be established and more firm in our faith, is to dig into the reasons that we have to believe. Yes, we, we do put our faith in something that's unseen, but it's not a blind faith. There is good evidence for God, good evidence for Jesus, for his life and his death and his resurrection. A couple of books I can recommend that really help to kind of map out that evidence are Lee Strobel's The Case for Christ. It's a bit of a classic. And John Dixon's Is Jesus History? It's a bit more recent uh, and a bit shorter as well. Well, that's the fact of the resurrection. What about its significance? What's the significance of Jesus' resurrection for us? Well, there's lots to say. But in the context of our passage this morning, the resurrection of Jesus is the basis for our hope that death is not the final word. Death is, was not the final word for Jesus. And as we are in him, united to him by faith, death is not the final word for us either. We're going to follow in Jesus' footsteps. That's what the passage means when it says that God will bring with Jesus all those who have fallen asleep. We're going to follow in Jesus' footsteps. I wonder, does anyone know what that is? What is it? Feel free to call out. Did someone say conduit? It's a conduit, yeah. I don't know much about being an electrician. I'm not very handy, but I do know that electricians and other trades sometimes use this stuff called conduit. So you can imagine it's quite hard to push flexible, floppy wires through ceilings and underground and that sort of thing. They they just can't do it. 
And so what they'll do instead, they'll run this stuff, conduit, through the ceiling, under the ground, and then they're able to run the wires through that conduit. And the reality for us as Christians is that Jesus is kind of like our conduit. He's gone before us through death and into eternal life. And as we are in him, we're kind of like the wire, following in his footsteps, tracing the path that he's already taken. Death is not the final word. We have hope. We can look backwards and see the path that Jesus has taken and have confidence that God will bring us with him through death and into eternal life. Brothers and sisters, one day you will die. And that day is going to come around pretty quickly. Sometimes I think my mum passed away when she was 54 years old from cancer. And if I go at the same age as her, I'm well over halfway there. Many of you, well over halfway there. But if you entrust yourself to Jesus, if you, the people that you love entrust themselves to Jesus, then death is not the final word. Actually, this passage says that death is more just like your body having a sleep. As you entrust yourself to Jesus, you can close your eyes in death or in sleep, safe in his arms, and know that when you open your eyes, he'll be there on the other side and you will see him face to face. Your soul will leave your body and you'll go to meet your risen saviour. But it gets better. Believe it or not, it actually gets better. You also get to look forward to the day where your soul and your body will be reunited along with everyone else that's fallen asleep in Jesus. That's the final thing that our text deals with. We have a hope that looks forward to that day. In verses 15 to 17, Paul writes, We who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Paul here is describing the second coming. Of Jesus. And when he uses that phrase, the coming of the Lord, he uses a Greek word, parousia, which is quite an important New Testament word. It comes up over and over when it's describing the second coming of Jesus. At the time, that word parousia was a word that was used to describe almost like a victorious king or emperor coming to a city as part of a victory parade. And what would happen is all the people would rush out to meet that victorious king or emperor. It was a grand procession. A bit like if you can imagine when soldiers from war come back and they, they walk the streets. You've probably seen those kinds of things on TV. That's the kind of idea that Paul has in mind. The coming of Jesus, we're told, will be... A bit like that. Everyone who's in Christ will rise to meet him in the air. Those who are dead will be physically raised up out of the grave. Their souls will be reunited with their bodies. That will happen first. And after that, those who are still alive when Jesus returns will be caught up in the clouds to meet their Lord Jesus in the air. Like a, a grand procession. Ancient Roman emperors would visit a city. Often a delegation would be sent out to meet them and escort them back. And that's the same idea that's being used here. There'll be a grand delegation of believers. The dead first and then the living who meet Jesus in the air and come back down with him to a world made new. 
where they'll be with him together forever. It's worth noticing briefly here that this is going to be a very public sort of a thing. We're not talking about what some people refer to as the secret rapture. Have you heard of this idea before? The idea that Before the second coming of Christ, some people will get secretly taken up into the air to be with him and then they'll come back with him at his final coming and there'll be others who are just kind of left behind. This is an idea that was popularised by that TV series, Left Behind. But there's no real basis for that. That's not what's being described here in our text. There's nothing secret about this. The text says there's going to be a loud cry the voice of an archangel, the sound of a trumpet. You won't miss it. No one who is in Christ is going to be left behind or miss out. The people you know and love who have died in Christ, they're going to be there. Your grandparents, your parents, other friends and family will all be there together celebrating and cheering on our victorious and returning Saviour. Lots of you would know the joy of a family reunion. The kids grow up and fly the coop and move to different parts of the country. And it can be a long time before you kind of all get back together under the one roof. And when you do, it can be really special. Brothers and sisters, that day when the dead in Christ are raised... And those who are living are caught up in the air to go and meet Jesus will be a bit like a family reunion. Think about it. The joy of victory from war and also a family reunion all rolled into one and lasting forever. We have that to look forward to. Real hope beyond the grave. There's nothing quite like it. But the best thing, the best thing about that day is that we'll be there with Jesus Christ. Our Saviour, the one who has made all these things possible. Our joy, our celebration, our worship won't be so much focused on each other, although that will be part of it, but it will be focused on him and all that he's done for us. We have a unique hope. It's a hope that looks backwards, and it's a hope that looks forwards. But what do we do with it now? What do we do do with this hope? Well, the final thing that uh, Paul writes is for us to encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another with these words. The obvious place to start is to encourage those who are grieving or hurting or who have lost someone or who are lonely or fearful of death. As we're able, we need to be proactive in catching up with them, opening the Bible with them, praying with and for them, pointing them to the great hope that they have in Jesus, encouraging them to to cling to him, And I think we get this, but it's worth saying that this isn't just the role of the pastor or elders or the pastoral care team. Notice that phrase again, one another. This kind of encouragement is a one another ministry. Because we need to be encouraged. Not only does the reality of death sometimes break into our life in in an ugly kind of way, But life itself, the Christian life in particular, can just be a bit of a slog sometimes. I'm sure that for each one of you, there are things that cause disappointment and hurt and confusion and doubt. And in the midst of all that, the temptation is, well, not so much the temptation, but just the the proclivity is to just lose sight of the hope that we have in Jesus, to get so focused on what's going on around us that we we lose sight of what he's done before and what he's coming to do in the future. 
And so we need one another to remind us and point us to the hope that we have in him. We actually need to be saying to each other, I have a coffee when we catch up for morning tea, when we spend time together during the week, when we share our hurts and disappointments with one another. We need to be saying to one another, Jesus is coming back. And that changes everything. To be encouraged by that reality, we need to keep it in our view. And to keep it in our view, we need to hear it from one another. Jesus is coming back. This life with all its hardships and hurts and disappointments and death is not the final word. We have a great hope and a sure hope. As sure as when it's winter time, we hope for spring, all the while knowing that spring is coming. In the same way, we hope for the wonderful coming of Jesus Christ, the day that we get to meet him, all the while knowing for sure that that day is coming. By God's grace, may he work that hope in us, that we might be a hopeful people for our good and for his glory. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you again for the wonderful hope that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for his death and his resurrection, uh, that you chose a time to break into our world, a real time in history, with a real person of history, your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that we can base our hope on those things. Help us to do that. Strengthen us in our faith. For those of us who wrestle with doubt or just the reality of these things seems far off for us, Lord, by your Spirit, would you press them home to our hearts this morning and beyond. And Lord, help us also to live in the light of the fact that Jesus is coming back, that we have so much to look forward to. Lord, help us not to lose sight of that either. Lord, help us to be people who encourage one another with these truths. Lord, give us words to speak. It's not always easy. Sometimes it can be awkward. But Lord, help us to overcome that for the sake of encouraging one another, building one another up, and being a people who are marked by a great hope in the Lord Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.